sleek, predatory, shark-like. The CCS class battlecruiser is one of the most numerous Covenant ships and has come to be ingrained into the imagination of swathes of displaced refugees from the human Covenant war. Images of this powerful capital ship has haunted the dreams of survivors of glass colonies for three decades. Fear is normal when confronting something you do not understand. So in the interests of giving those who are haunted by this vessel some respite, it's time we understood what makes this beast work. Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00 and today we give the Covenant CCS class battlecruiser the most detailed treatment. As this is a ship we will be opting to look at our overall exterior, hull and superstructure and then analyse her from stem to stern, looking at each of the three major hull sections as we go. The law regarding this vessel is substantial, with information gleaned from naval engagements and the direct mission logs of Master Chief when he boarded the Truth and Reconciliation on Alpha Halo. However, there are areas where information is sparse. I will use references from Halo Warfleet, Halopedia, in-game lore and information from the books to flesh out as much as humanly possible, but there will inevitably be some areas that a degree of speculation will take place. However, when these arise, I will notify you as such, and use known principles of science and technology offset by my qualifications and knowledge of material science and technology to explain them as best I can. With all that said, let's do this. The CCS class battlecruiser is a mid-sized Covenant capital ship. It is one of the most recognisable ships in the Covenant fleet with a sleek shark-like predatory design. By far one of the most common types of Covenant ship, the CCS has been encountered by UNSC forces at practically every spaceborne engagement since the beginning of the Human Covenant War. The CCS measures 1,782 metres or 5,850 feet in length, 862 metres or 2,830 feet in width, and 230.8 metres or 757 feet in height, with a mass of 90.7 million metric tons. This puts the CCS's width at 30 meters more than the Burj Khalifa is tall and being over twice the length, and if landed groundside would be two and a half times taller than the Statue of Liberty and a little less than the mass of the entire human population of North and South America and Europe combined. CCS class battlecruisers tend to be deployed in three ship battle groups where their armament, agility, manoeuvrability and power can be utilised to devastating effect. Capable of individually carrying an entire invading army of Covenant personnel and equipment, in the early days of the Human Covenant War a single CCS class battlecruiser could effectively invade and neutralise the average human colony on its own. The shielding of the ships alone has been witnessed as being able to withstand a near direct strike from a Shiva nuclear warhead and can deal out devastating damage from its plethora of energy based weapon systems. The most notable ship of the line was the Truth and Reconciliation, a ship that served with the Fleet of Particular Justice, the second largest fleet of the entire Covenant military, which was the same fleet headed by Thel Vadami, eventually to be known as the Arbiter. The ship saw battle alongside the fleet over nearly three decades of war, playing a part in the fall of Reach and a pivotal role in the Battle of Installation 04, where it eventually met its end at the actions of one First Lieutenant Melissa McKay. As with all Covenant ships, the CCS makes extensive use of energy shield systems. 
While the ship doesn't appear to have any immediately visible shield emitters, it could be that the lights along the hull surface may be some of them with others integrated directly into the nanocomposite armoured hull of the ship itself. I say this because there is a notable texture to the hull of the ship, a small cellular hexagonal pattern features extensively across the hull, and it just so happens that the shielding when excited appears to show a similar repeating hexagonal pattern. This leads me to the conclusion that at the boundaries of the hexagonal pattern on the hull are quantum scale shield emitters that effectively project a good distance above the hull. The shielding emitters create an electromagnetic field of oscillating polarity in this geometric pattern with close enough field density to avoid collapse, but not too close which may result in a short circuit. These now enlarged hexagonal electromagnetic elements then contain the shield's primary medium, which is still assumed to be a highly charged plasma medium, and is then injected or projected into the space between the fields and becomes the hexagonal shield element which are all aligned creating the body of the energy shield. When not excited by an external energy source, the shielding is invisible to the eye. When the shielding begins to take damage, they flare. The colour of the shield's flare indicate the energy level of the shielding. The shielding of Covenant ships tends to be blue. The blue appearance of the energy shields indicates that the energy shielding systems operate at a high frequency, meaning they also require more energy to operate. Due to the relationship between energy and shield strength, this makes the shielding of the CCS class extremely powerful. In my video about how powerful Macs are, we came to the conclusion that a Super Mac can destroy two capital ships and severely injure a third, and we calculated that a Super Mac is rated at 52.44 gigatons, and since the CCS class is a capital ship, we estimated in order to destroy a CCS it would take 21 gigatons. However, we're not talking about destroying the ship outright, we're looking into the shield strength. It's widely accepted that the major advantage of Covenant ships is the energy shield, so even if two thirds of the total energy required to kill a CCS was taken up dropping the shields, that would give the shields an estimated energy fail capacity of 14 gigatons. That's the equivalent of 1 million Hiroshima bombs. Link to the aforementioned video is in the video description. It is also noteworthy that in order for the ship to fire its weapons, the shielding nearby the respective weapon has to be dropped, creating a temporary but accessible hole in the shields and thus a possible weakness to be exploited. The CCS's hull surface is purple in colour and accented by cyan plasma conduits and a nearly iridescent sheen. The armour plating of the hull is a nanolaminar alloy. This means that varying metals and alloys are layered in a process that makes the materials fully dense, while also layering different atomic structures of metals and alloys in specific orientations and at thicknesses on the sub-micron scale. The reason that the exact alloy that has been used in much of the Covenant armour plating is unknown or cannot be ascertained is because a single sample of a nanolaminar armour plating will have such a plethora of metals and alloys layered on the nano scale at different orientations that any given sample simply would not meet any known iteration or permutation of any one known element, alloy or composite. This technique of layering materials on the nano scale can be employed to create alloys with properties such as improved toughness, strength, thermal properties and corrosion that are a function of the interfaces in the nano layers. They can be created by using a bath containing multiple metal ion elements. By changing the current at precise moments to select a different element, it can create a layered structure. Some nanolaminar alloys have shown eight times the resistance of carbon steels to degradation and in some cases no measurable degradation whatsoever. This makes the armoured hull of the CCS significantly more resistant to damage than even the UNSC's Titanium A battle plate, although direct nuclear blasts can burn and peel away the armour plating, while kinetic rounds like that of the UNSC's MAC weapons will puncture the hull and tear through the armour like tissue paper if the hull is unshielded. The superstructure of the ship appears to be modelled around the ship's dominant features. The teardrop shaped hull section along the top appears to denote a line of superstructure, while protruding struts and apparent hard points along the belly of the ship seem to indicate a more conventional keel-like design. This provides all the structural rigidity needed from the ship with cross bracings and additional structure being connected to this main superstructure. 
The CCS has an impressive armament of weapons for both defensive and aggressive action. This includes one Profiro pattern excavation beam which fires a thin beam of highly energetic particles, or plasma. It typically requires a brief charging period during which time a visible maelstrom of plasma appears around the emitter. The beam has an effective range of over 100,000 kilometers. The beam varies in color based on the effective power output of the weapon at any given time, but it generally appears as a silver white color, similar to the scintillation effect that is seen when a Covenant ship's energy shields are hit. Beams in the red, purple, orange and blue spectra have also been observed. One, Ignis Pattern Plasma Lance, which is a kind of energy projector employed by Covenant starships as an ultra-heavy anti-ship weapon. Plasma Lances fire tightly focused streams of plasma at their enemies, dealing a great deal of kinetic and thermal damage. At close range, Plasma Lances are capable of cutting unshielded warships in half. 16 Serpents Pattern Plasma Torpedo Silos upon contact a plasma torpedo causes severe damage to the target, boiling armor or overloading shields. The weapon can be used in conjunction with pulse laser turrets and energy projectors to destroy entire UNSC fleets. 42 Sono Pattern Plasma Cannons These cannons are most prominently mounted in arrays and fire only in a straight line and are less powerful than plasma torpedoes. The bolts fired by plasma cannons are typically blue or blue-purple. 50 Gon Pattern Pulse Lasers The pulse laser turret is one of the Covenant's primary weapon systems, often classified as a point defense weapon and compared to the UNSC's point defense guns. On top of the impressive shipborne weapons and armaments, the CCS also carries a large number of troops and equipment including 180 obedient trees, otherwise known as commanding officers, at the rank of major, 2,500 warriors, likely referencing the minor elites, 4,100 thralls, which likely means the lower races of the Covenant, 500 menials or domestic servants, likely referring to the attending maintenance crew of Yanmi or drones, 2 Hurugok or engineers, Eight superiors, likely referring to Officer General and Shipmaster Sangeli. The CCS also carries 55 insertion pods for rapid orbital deployment of troops to terra firma, 10 Spirit or Phantom dropships, 50 Banshees, 20 Tick boarding craft, 44 Shadow Troop transports, 32 Seraph or Tarask strike craft, 48 Wraith mortar tanks, and 150 Ghost scouts all adding to the ship's ability to dispatch a powerful military presence quickly and effectively. The bow of the CCS-class battlecruiser features the plasma lance and a secondary pinch fusion reactor. The bulbous shape is due to the presence of this secondary pinch fusion reactor, as the reactor requires shielding and containment fields to be safe. This secondary reactor powers the plasma lance and any other weapon systems in the bow of the ship, including the point defense lasers and plasma torpedoes. The fins on the front of the ship are possibly to help in maneuverability and atmosphere, as well as perhaps containing some degree of steering systems, perhaps making additional use of gravitics in order to change the direction of the ship. It is assumed a lot of the communications arrays for the Covenant battle net and slip space communication systems is also located in the bow of the ship. The outer hull surface of the midship is punctuated by plasma torpedo pods and point defense pulse lasers. The underbelly is dominated by the gravity lift and primary excavation beam, and the overall shape of this part of the ship is mainly due to the ship's primary pinch fusion reactor contained at its core, with ample room given around it for shielding and the massive plasma energy conduits which run into and out of the reactor. Though we have never seen the full extent of the interior of the CCS, there are many areas within the ship we are familiar with. This is due mainly to the mission logs of Master Chief during his time aboard the Truth and Reconciliation. While the corridors appear labyrinthine, many of the access ways to the areas beyond are sealed, so we can only infer what is behind these doors. That being said, the fact that the ship has a single gravity lift, four cargo bays leading off of the gravity lift room, and four hangar bays, two on the port, two on the starboard, suggests a large degree of the ship's corridors, at least in this area, are symmetrical mirrors of each other. It is worth noting, however, that the exact topography of the corridors and major rooms encountered on the Truth and Reconciliation doesn't match up exactly with the exterior of the vessel. 
In the picture provided here, you can see a scaled representation of the deck layout from the two occasions Chief was aboard the ship, once during the Truth and Reconciliation and once during Keys. And from this, it is suggested that the ship has two separate gravity lifts, when it is understood there is only one. The hangar bays are the point of reference for scaling, as we know that there are four and they are all identical in layout, so the mirroring of these gives us a good perception of scale and location. You can see by this picture that the locations of the gravity lifts don't actually align with the known positions of the gravity lift. Interestingly enough, the scaling issue that we have encountered with the UNSC ships is non-existent with Covenant ships. The scale differences between the ships in-game do actually scale correctly, with the spirit fitting inside of the hangar bays in exactly the right proportions. This is the polar opposite to UNSC ships where the pelicans don't actually fit within the pelican bays. So while the scaling for Covenant ships doesn't appear to be an issue, the geographical layout of the decks continues to be an ongoing issue. But I will cover this in a future video, and be sure to watch the ship scaling problem video, the link is in the description. Like most Covenant warships, the CTS class battlecruiser is equipped with a single ventrally mounted gravity lift, enabling quick and easy transportation of personnel, vehicles, equipment and supplies to a planet's surface. A large circular platform can be detached and lowered to the ground to provide a stable surface for disembarking and embarking troops, vehicles and material. The platform has six interlocking hinges and is carried with the ship. When the cruiser is in position over a planet's surface, the six interlocks retract and the beam repels the platform at a controlled descent to the surface. Once on the ground, the platform acts as an anchor for the ship. The ship can make use of the gravity lift without the platform, but it must remain in position. When attached to the ship, the central gravity platform doubles as a firing port for the energy projector, like that of the CAS class assault carrier and the CSO class supercarrier. The gravity lift bay is similar in design to the cargo bays except that it is only one level high. The gravity lift's door mechanism is situated in the centre of the room, with cargo and personnel hatches located around the rectangular bay walls. Several gravity lift bays are on board the cruisers, not far from the cargo and shuttle bays. Each bay has four cargo hatches along opposite walls for vehicular transfer. The CCS class battlecruiser has at least four cargo bays. These bays are connected to cargo hatches and corridors that allow the transfer of material from the bays to either the gravity lift room or the hangar bays. The storage bays are two level expanses that contain weapons, food and military equipment crates in addition to storing both land and air vehicles. The CCS class battlecruiser contains four bisected hangar bays, two to starboard, two to port. They are each three tiered with a large amount of space between the floors and ceilings of each level. Each three tier bay has two retracting metal doors. The bay features energy barriers over the hangar doors, a type of visible energy field used to separate a pressurized environment from the vacuum of space. Energy barriers are useful because they allow solid matter through but not gases such as oxygen and neon. However, before matter passes through, the pressure on both sides must be equalized to minimize the risk of explosive decompression. The barriers can also be configured to block all vehicles or personnel or allow them to pass through when required. Each launch area in the bay is capable of housing dropships and banshee attack craft. Retracting elevators in the decking of each bay are used to ship Covenant ground and aircraft into the base for launching or for gravity connection to a waiting dropship. These elevators lower into holding areas adjacent to the cargo base. Buried deep within the vessel's heart is the control centre, also known as the bridge and the combat information centre, from where the entire ship's operations are coordinated. Typically occupied by only the highest ranking officers, the control center is a large room with a centralized bridge platform overlooking the rest of the room. Holographic controls line the outer perimeter of this raised platform. The view screens are also holographic projections visible at the forward end of the room near the ceiling. The view screens can either display exterior views of the ship's surroundings or can display tactical data. They can also be synchronized to the ship's security cameras and display ship schematics. The CCS has at least two brigs for holding prisoners. 
Each is a rectangular room with four force field secured cells on either side, for a total of eight per brig. Each cell can accommodate a large number of prisoners, although normally only one is placed in each cell, probably for security purposes against the possibility of an organised escape attempt. The cell barriers appear to use the same technology as the shield doors that are common to Covenant installations and vessels, though they obviously do not allow passage from one side to the other. Even plasma bolts and ballistic projectiles cannot pass through the fields. The shield barriers can be lowered by a holographic control panel on a raised platform on the far side of the brig, opposite the entrance. The cells are arranged at the periphery of a spacious room, with guards patrolling them. The guards usually have active camouflage, using their stealth to monitor the prisoners. Located along the centre line of the ship, dominating the central hub of the CCS's midship, is the primary pinch fusion reactor. The Covenant use a technique which replicates the conditions inside the core of a star, using deuterium and tritium as a fuel source, which are isotopes of hydrogen, with a nucleus that contains a proton-neutron pair and a proton-neutron-neutron trio, respectively, where a normal, more common hydrogen atom known as protium has no neutron at all. Because of this method, it can be considered a purer, more natural way of producing energy, if a little uninspired. The pinch fusion reactor generates energy by the use of artificial gravity generators. These gravity generators create highly focused and powerful gravity fields which, as a causative effect, give a close approximation to the forces at work within the core of a main sequence star. The physical shape of the reactor, with its two cone-shaped gravity focusing generators positioned one above the other, their tips in close proximity, allow the gravity field to be focused down from larger macro area to an extraordinarily small micro area, facilitating the continued fusion reaction by literally pinching matter inside a very tiny gravity reinforced area. This means that when the reactor then injects a steady stream of deuterium and tritium, the particles immediately encounter this environment and act as though they were actually within the core of a star. They are suddenly pinched and powerfully forced together, fusing them into a helium-4 nucleus and a free neutron almost instantly, generating huge amounts of energy in the form of light and heat. The energy that is released is then used as the primary source of energetic excitation to energise the plasma medium that all Covenant technology seems to use as the basis of their energy source. The plasma within the reaction area is kept compressed by high-strength magnetic fields, ensuring the reaction can be sustained continuously. The carapace that surrounds the base of each focus cone generate incredibly strong energy shields and magnetic fields that contain the reaction. If this energy shield fails or is breached, the fusion reaction becomes uncontained and immediately draws mass and energy towards it, increasing its critical temperature, resulting in a cataclysmic explosion. The energised plasma medium is then vectored from the reactor across the ship via the plasma conduits to where it is needed. These conduits thereby allow the flow of free electrons held within the plasma medium to power the various devices and functions of the ship. Hull Section 3's primary purpose is to contain the ship's repulsor engines, its FTL drive and its tertiary pinch fusion reactor. Not much is known about the engine room other than it contains the tertiary pinch fusion reactor, is in very close proximity to the FTL drive and the repulsor engines, and its connection to the bridge is achieved via fiber optic cables that run to and from the control room. If these cables are severed, the ship loses all flight control and crashes. Being more technologically advanced than humanity, the Covenant have numerous advantages in slipspace propulsion systems. While the human Shaw Fujikawa engine is said to punch a hole between the realms using brute force, Covenant engines instead take a small rupture and delicately enlarge it with surgical precision. This allows the latter to execute far more accurate slips. The CCS uses the often patterned borer. The engine creates slipspace ruptures by utilising high power energy projection streams that capture a rupture and gently expand it by feeding it cyclical oscillating energy beams that then expands in a flute-like shape rapidly increasing the diameter until it is large enough to move the ship through. This can be seen in the moments before and during a slipspace rupture. The area ahead of the ship's nose ripples as a rupture is caught and fed immense levels of energy via the nearly microscopic energy tendril 
and once it hits a critical mass, the energy expands the rotating fluted energy field, as seen by the rapidly rotating trend of radiation that is emitted at the rupture's border. It is unknown if the engine physically creates this rupture itself or if it simply captures one that exists within the quantum foam, while the Shure Fujikawa Translate engine uses brute force to create a rupture using high-powered particle accelerators and a quantum field that the engine then effectively forces through the rupture, it is understood Covenant Translate engines are more elegant in their function. It is because of this that I believe that it is likely that the engine in fact utilizes a property of the quantum foam in order to operate. A virtual black hole is a black hole that exists temporarily as a result of quantum fluctuations of space-time. They wink in and out of existence constantly within the quantum foam of the universe. It seems likely that the engine simply captures one of these virtual black holes and feeds it enough energy to enlarge it into the macro scale and then proceeds to enlarge it to move the ship through. When in slip space the ship still needs to be stabilized and protected from the exotic physics of the higher dimensions of slip space, similar to UNSC ships that generate a quantum field around the ship to maintain a bubble of normal space time around the ship, Covenant ships utilize their energy shield systems to a similar effect. The energy shielding is augmented with a quantum field generator, whereby an oscillating opposing harmonic frequency is generated to match and oppose the quantum fluctuations of slip space, thereby stabilizing the ship's transition. Covenant slip space drives are often referred to as jump drives. In addition to their more powerful thruster engines, it has been theorized by the UNSC that the Covenant drives generate several micro jumps within a single slip space transition to measure the dilation involved in a jump, allowing them to reach their destination faster. Covenant drives are generally more flexible and powerful than those of humans, and they have thrice been seen to execute in atmosphere slip space transitions although the first time in question was controlled by a human AI. In addition, Covenant drives can also execute successful slips, even if underpowered. The CTS's main engines are Galbian pattern repulsor engines. These do not work like conventional thrust engines. Repulsor engines use stacked tidal gravity generators which create asymmetrical gravity fields that push and pull a ship through space in a desired vector all without the need for reaction mass or conventional exhaust. I believe this means that the engines actually generate extremely powerful artificial gravity fields or gravitic tidal force that the ship is effectively pulled towards, falls into or is pushed along by. In the same way that a comet would fall towards the sun, the ship generates an artificial gravity field that is focused ahead of the center of mass relative to the direction of travel. The gravity field then attracts the mass of the ship, causing the ship to begin moving towards the center of gravity, but since the field is being produced by the now moving ship, the field moves as well, causing the ship to continue to fall towards it. In order to steer the ship, for example, moving to port, the gravitic field is moved to the left of the ship's center of mass, causing the ship to begin turning. In order to slow down, the field is moved to behind the center of mass, causing the ship to begin slowing to a standstill. The rate of acceleration is varied and controlled by how strong the gravitic field is. The stronger the gravity, the higher the acceleration. This engine function may also explain the physical shape, form and topography of many Covenant ships. In the case of the CCS, the vast majority of its mass is located towards the rear of the ship, with the mass tapering off towards the nose of the ship. All of the major crew areas and functional areas of the ship are within the main body, with the nose being much smaller and streamlined. This may be to allow the gravitic fields to be projected with little interference to an area ahead of the center of mass. The internal artificial gravity systems appear to be unaffected by this very powerful thrust method, likely through some exotic means of gravitic shielding or simply through attenuation. The exhaust of the ship then is not the reaction mass and thus not the source of thrust, instead it would appear that these are simply thermal exhausts, a way to bleed off the incredible levels of energy and heat that result from the process of gravitic thrust generation. Although the ship isn't a CCS class battlecruiser, it would explain then why in this scene in the Long Night of Solace, the Sabres are tasked with shooting the engine nozzles of the ship, in the hopes of slowing her down. This doesn't stop the ship, it just slows it down. And later on, once the crew have actually boarded the ship, the ship's normal thrusters are turned back on and it moves towards the Long Night of Solace with no issue. 
If these apparent thruster nozzles are in fact just heat exhausts, then that would explain why the ship slows down but then achieves its normal speed later on, because shooting into the engine muzzles simply caused the heat exchanger to overheat and not function correctly, thus meaning that the engine could not operate at its nominal level, and once the ship had been given time to cool down again, the thrusters could then be used at its normal power. An extremely sophisticated application of gravitics, these engines are powered by a ship's pinch fusion reactors and modern repulsor engines are finely tuned and expected to operate for years without maintenance refreshes. A repulsor engine also produces quantum fluctuations in its wake that are extremely hazardous to personnel and nearby vessels within its range, particularly when operating at high thrust. This method of thrust that Covenant ships use is extremely interesting and I'd be really interested in finding out more information should it appear in the lore in the near or distant future. The CCS class battlecruiser is a Covenant tool for destruction, whether it's engaging in ship to ship combat, acting as a scout for a larger invasion fleet, glassing a planet from orbit, unearthing hidden forerunner superstructures or settling down planet side to disembark an immense invasion force, the CCS succeeds in everything that it does. Its arsenal of weapons, troops, vehicles and defences are as intimidating as its predatory, organic, beast-like appearance, and it has kept many human survivors awake at night as they remember the images of massive purple pearlescent shark-like ships eclipsing the sun and raining fire down on the cities of fallen colonies, their aggressive form outlined by unsettled skies, raging fires, plasma bombardment and accented by the screams of its victims, is a thing of nightmares. This powerful capital ship has served the Covenant well, but now we understand it, we have confronted our enemy with impervious resolve and we are not afraid. But they should be. Thanks for watching, stick your comments down below, I look forward to what you have to say. Massive shout out to the guys over at Sins of the Prophets mod for supplying the high quality renders of the CCS class battlecruiser for this video. Link to their mod DB and Discord are below, and also you'll find the links to the other videos that I've mentioned during this one in the description down below as well. The Sins of the Prophets is an awesome game mod, and they're an epic group of guys. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons, Neek the Silent Cartographer, Brian, Sebastian, Red Sea, Darian, Stalker of the Realms, Falcon X003, Alvin, Mr. Fell, Flaming Halo, The Revanche, Starlight, Viking, Legions Lost, The TG7, and Terrell, The Holders of the Mantle, my glorious reclaimers, my most loyal of Metarchs, and all the other patrons that have jumped aboard to support the channel. You guys are awesome, and all of this would not be possible without you. If you like Halo Lord Discuss to insane levels of detail, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Be sure to support us on all major social media channels, including Discord, and if you really love the channel, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting the channel over there. It would mean the world to me and would free up more of my time for me to put into this content and other Halo-related goodness. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain.